of this, and I must be the only person who's never got past The Hobbit. You know, I've never read the rest of those things at all. <laughs> I'm not proud of it particularly, but that's the way it is. But I am, and I hope you will be proud to know, Philip, that this book I took on holiday to Portugal less than two weeks ago, and I was there for seven days, and I finished it. <laughs> this is the only book. It was particularly good because I didn't have to do anything. There was my wife and a lady friend of hers there. And they kept saying, oh, come and swim, come and swim. And I hate swimming. So no, I'm going to read my book. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid they thought it was a zombie movie or something like that. Dead zone. It has to be. <laughs> but I read it that way once and then I read it again. Um, just another one short thing I would like to say about and the nature of the book, in a sense. Um, as the years go by, I've given myself a bit of a sort of a, a little motto because I get asked questions, I get asked more and more and more questions about the environment and birds and wildlife and all that sort of thing. And I've always made it a rule that I won't talk about or pretend to know about something I don't know anything about. It's not a bad rule, because politicians take no notice of it at all, <laughs> and, uh, and Mrs. May even less, but there you go. Um, but, <laughs> but no, I never do that, and, and, and yet I have to admit, although I'm in the environmental lobby or something, whatever you call it, you know, I've often thought I couldn't really explain a lot of what I sort of know to be true, even prepared to go marching for, but I don't really know the details. You get little bits here, little bits there, and this book really did clarify. That's what it's about to me. Clarion call, we'll see. But to me, it was a great clarifier. If you're not too sure, have a look in here. You don't have to read it at one go. We'll all go to Portugal on holiday. It's very nice. Eh? <laughs> so, <laughs> Philip, oh, my microphone's slipping down my leg. <laughs> <laughs> it's information you probably don't need to know. <laughs> I promise you, it's, it's actually quite pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to back up here and enjoy it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> 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 Is yours gone now? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's still there, but... <laughs> I'll find yours here, so It's a little pack. You put it on, didn't you? Yes! I'm pulling it up again. The square lump is... Is it? Okay. I've no intention of jumping up and down, so it should be all right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. A little diversion. There you go. <laughs> uh, Philip. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. Uh, let me distract you for a moment, thank Bill. You. Thank you so much, and thank you all for being here tonight. And I, and I'm I'm in danger of making a mistake that I I made in St Paul's Cathedral. A few years ago, um, Compassion World Farming, so the organisation I'm proud to, to work for, was hosting uh, an event, an event that we are for this year hosting tomorrow, um, but not in St Paul's. And this is a big corporate awards event. And whilst we were in St Paul's, um, I, uh, I was thrilled that Bill was going to be our Master of Ceremonies. But I made the mistake of introducing Bill as my childhood hero. And I remember, I remember Bill getting up and putting his, putting his elbow on the podium like this, very theatrical, and going, oh, oh, how depressing, how depressing to be introduced as a childhood hero by a middle-aged bull. But nevertheless, Childhood or not, Bill is my hero, and I'm so thrilled to be working with you tonight. And let me tell you, I'll bring, I'll bring in some themes along that line, those lines, if you can bear it, um, as we go. But uh, I, I also want to thank you, Bill, for persevering with the book. I'm sorry I read 
to, too much. It's a good job. Sorry, I wrote too much. You did, I didn't say that. Did I say <laughs> that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Seven days is a long time. security speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I wrote too much. No, you didn't. You Thank wrote you. Just enough. Thank you. That's very kind. Well. What I did was I wrote Dead Zone off the back of a previous Bloomsbury book with another cheery title called Farmageddon. And uh, Farmageddon was very much a book where I was seeking to set out why I felt that factory farming, the biggest cause of animal cruelty on the planet, should also be an issue of concern to everyone who eats food that it is the problem at the centre of our food system. It is the thing which needs changing for all our sakes, for animal welfare, for the environment, for public health, for good health and nutrition. What I wanted to do with Dead Zone is just take the argument on a notch further. If you like, if Dead Zone was, if Farmageddon was throwing a pebble in the pond and the ripples were coming out, uh, Dead Zone would trace one of the significant ripples to show that factory farming is not only the biggest cause of animal cruelty on the planet, keeping hens in tiny cages, chickens crowded in, in airless barns, pigs crated where they can't turn around, cattle in feedlots, not just the biggest issue of farm animal cruelty, it's a major driver of extinction. And to make this point, what I share in the book is the fact that 40 odd years ago, was it really that long ago? 40 odd years ago, I fell headlong and sink, he headline, hook, line and sinker in love with wildlife. You know, so much so that I remember uh, many a classroom incident where I was looking out of, the, out, out of the window, looking for peregrines. I'd read a book by a chap called Baker about this mythical bird, the peregrine, that is the fastest uh, moving <coughs> creature on the planet, stooping at more than 200 miles an hour. And you know, I spent many a time looking out of the window. I never did see a peregrine, but I did get to stand in the corner a lot. I did get clipped around the ear and made to do detention. In those days, I also turned family holidays into mini safaris. And you know, I, I took every opportunity I could to hitchhike to places like Norfolk. I was inspired by uh, books like this one, Bill Oddie's Little Black Bird Book, which I'm pleased to say was signed by the author. Bill, thank you. All of that time ago. Have you read that? I've read it more times than I can imagine. On holiday, never in Portugal, because I've not been there, but uh, I also read this book, Gone Birdie, uh, by, also by Bill Odin, signed twice by the author. Bill, thank you. Thank you. And this one, Follow That Bird. Follow That Bird. That wasn't signed by the author, but thankfully, as of tonight, thank you, Bill. It is. <laughs> I remember that at the time you showed me that one, and I said, "Oh, bugger off! I'm getting tired. <laughs> sign any more books, you know." <laughs> <laughs> thank you sincerely, and I'm also keeping uh, keeping count of the time using this, my rare bird alert pager. Do you remember these? I do. It beeps and we dash off. That's the what I was yeah. <laughs> But you know, seriously, 40, 40 years ago, <laughs> beeps at all times of day yeah, in the most, in the most awkward of situations. Um, but uh, you, the, the, what I didn't realise way back then, 40 years ago, was that the object of my fascination, birds in our countryside, were disappearing before my very eyes. In the last 40 years, Britain has lost 44 million birds, most of them once common farmland birds. That's more than a pair, breeding pair, every minute. And the reason for this is quite simple, that over the last decades, a new form of agriculture swept across the countryside industrial agriculture. And I don't know if you've noticed uh, that uh, many of, the, of, of our nation's farm animals have disappeared. 
the two are the two are connected. Uh, farm animals, chickens, pigs, uh, and increasingly cattle, have been disappearing from pasture, from the land, and put into factory farms. Chickens in tiny cages and so on. And this was all a premise, this was all adopted uh, 50 odd years ago on the premise that you know, this was not going to be cruel to the farm animals, not cruel to the chickens. Putting them in these cages was fine after all. If they weren't happy, they wouldn't lay eggs. It was also based on the premise that it would be a space-saving idea. Cram all the animals in a small space. Wonderful. Think of all of that extra land that you then have. But what was over overlooked in that equation was that by taking them off of the land where they forage or, or feed on grass and putting them inside, you then have to use vast acreages elsewhere of scarce arable land to grow their feed, be that cereals or soya or other crops that could be feeding people, or that land could be growing food for people, but is now uh, feeding these farm animals. And it's one of, the, one of the great disappearing acts. It's like a cascade of cruelty, if you like, because it's not only the farm animals disappear, but because of the industrial pesticide-laden way in which their feed is produced over vast acreages, the trees start to disappear, and the bushes and the hedges and with them go the wild flowers, and when, there's, when the wild flowers go, so do the seeds. And the insects, like bees, hoverflies, butterflies. And with them go the birds, and the bats, and the butterflies. And what's not seen is that on continents far away, but no less direct as an impact, we start seeing the disappearance of jaguars, and elephants, and even penguins, as I'll explain in a moment. And then in the greatest disappearing act of all, most of the food value, most of the food value of those crops are then wasted by feeding them to the farm animals who then waste um, uh, the majority in terms of calories and protein in conversion to meat, milk and eggs. What we set up is this competition, essentially, between people and animals for food. How big is that competition now? Well, it's getting out of hand. Already globally, if you put all of the crops now growing food for farm animals into one field, that field would cover the entire land surface of the European Union. Putting it another way, if the animals were restored to the land where they're not in competition with people, and that, that arable land were feeding people directly, then those crops could feed an extra four billion people on the planet. Makes you think. Huh? And what we've seen as this cascade of cruelty, as this industrial agriculture sweeps across the countryside, is every year we see a new successive, a new all-time low for our birds be they skylarks or lapwings or turtle doves, you name it. And I'm, I'm a, as I know Bill is, I'm a huge supporter of conservation organisations. Uh, I've been, uh, for, for those 40 years, I've been a supporter of the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, the RSPB, a charity that I love. I love with all my heart. And, and I think that uh, you know, they do amazing work conservation work, bringing back things like avocets and red kites and yes, I was there and I say in the book how I was there the night the first avocets hatched out and returned to breed at the RSPV reserve at Titchwell up in Norfolk, which Bill, you know well too. And, and but, you, but you see, those conservation success stories in terms of the numbers, they're bringing rare birds back, marginal birds back. You know, if you double or treble the numbers of those rare birds, the overall number is still low. What we've seen over the majority of the countryside, and by the way, agriculture accounts for 70% of the entire land surface of our country here in the UK. <coughs> As industrial agriculture sweeps across that countryside, so those once common farmland birds over much of the countryside 
get squeezed out onto nature reserves where they become effectively <coughs> refugees. Hmm. It doesn't have to be like that. As, as Bill, you'll, you'll know, we'll talk about this in a moment. It doesn't have to be like this. And what I've seen very locally, I live in a Hampshire village. I'm very privileged to do so with my wife, Helen. And uh, one of our neighbours is an award-winning conservation farmer. He runs a, a big farm by UK standards, five times bigger than the UK uh, uh, national average. And often my conversations with him are a snatched affairs. Usually he's wound down the window on his 4 by 4 and he's driving by in a flaming hurry and he's shouting out of the window at me. And the conversations are, are you know, often revolving around how the local cricket team is doing or uh, you know, whether my wife has still got pink hair, things of this nature. Uh, but on this particular... Uh, she hasn't, as you can see tonight. Um, but on this particular occasion, he wanted to tell me that he was so proud. He was so proud that his two pairs of barn owls had fledged young. So I said, that's amazing. And you know, it's worth noting that in the, in, in the days when there were many farms in this country, just about every farm had a breeding pair. Now there are many fewer farms, and one in 75 farms in this country has a breeding pair. George has two. So I asked him round for breakfast, and we had a, you know, the best conversation I've ever had with him. And he came round and he said, oh, Philip, I've just been talking to the local RSPB. And I said, that's fantastic. Love them. And he said, yes, and I've been telling them how birds on my farm are coming back. They're bucking the national trend. And I said, George, that's amazing. What's the secret? And he said to me, oh, Philip, it's not rocket science. It's mixed farming. That's what I do. Mixed farming. And what he meant by that is that farm animals, cattle and sheep in this case, are restored, not overstocked, but restored to their ecological niche on his farm, and they move around in rotation with the crops, building soil fertility. He's leaving areas for the wild flowers to come back, and so he's seeing the bees coming back, and he's got a whole range, he's got half the... Uh, the country species of butterflies on his, on his farm. And it just shows you what can be done. And Bill, you, you, you and I had a conversation um, around the book maybe 18 months, a couple of years ago, and you were talking about how things have changed in your lifetime. Well, yeah. You've noticed uh, the change I mean, in the countryside. Simple, simple statement is that... Um, you have to be quite old to actually remember what it was like. And that's honestly true. And I mean, you know, if, uh, I was grateful to everybody who gets into conservation. If they're young people, terrific, you know. And I think uh, I hasten to add, I don't know when I'm speaking to anybody here tonight who was involved in this, but anybody who voted in the last election the right way, I think you know what that was. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, because it's one of the most heartening things I've heard for years, actually, that younger people got out there and said, you load of, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> but, um, yes, uh, but, but you can't know what it used to be like. I often feel like, you know, if somebody goes to um, a nature reserve or a farmland and gets shown round by the farmer or by somebody who's been there before, and they see a lapwing or two, a skylark or two, um, no doubt the person with them is going to say, ah, you should have been here 30, 40 years ago. And I, I've had time and time again I've seen that. I used to live on the edge of Birmingham. And there was a farm there, which I've got my old notebooks going right back to when I was about 15. Uh, I was born in 1941, so you can work it out. Um, and... Uh, and I've got my old notebook there, and it's, it, you know, it's sort of the date and place and this sort of thing. And on farm field, stubble field, flock of 200 yellowhammers. And down here it'll say 50 tree sparrows, and so on and so forth. Large flock of lapwings. 
it's it, nobody's nobody now going out for the first time would see any of those things. So it's very difficult to know what you're doing, um, what you're sort of aiming at in a way. But I, I'm going to slightly take issue. I think. I warned you. <laughs> you did. I slightly take it as one thing you just said about, mm. you said they're refugees mm. on a nature reserve. I mean, I'm a, I, I am afraid of the opinion that not only Britain, but the world in general is very close to the stage where there is virtually no natural countryside left. And the only way to guarantee that there is a space for wildlife is for a kickoff to own that land. So it's not the government's land, it's not Lord so and so's land. Some NGO has got together with other people, raise money. It happens all over the world. I do quite a lot for an organization called World Land Trust, mm -hmm. and they have reserves all over the place, South America, India, everywhere, which they've bought. They don't own them, but they work in conjunction with local people who are into the same thing. And I think they prove absolutely irrevocably that the only way of hanging on to quite a lot of these species is to create reserves. Mm. So I don't, I know we mean refugees, but I, let's look at them as if they're on holiday. Absolutely. A, a nostalgia yeah. holiday or something like that. <laughs> they're going back. My God, it used to be like this 30 years ago. And it does work. It does work. You only have to say, look at the birds that are now common here, you know, to younger people going out now into the countryside and say, blimey, red kites are all over the place, mm. aren't they? When I was a kid, there was one pair nested on a, in a river valley in the middle of Wales and you had to go there, drive around for about three days before you saw it about a mile away and probably convinced yourself that it, that buzzard was actually a kite or something like that. Um, but now they're everywhere because they've been introduced into the right places by people who know what the right places are. And that's, that's, that's happening with quite a few species. Yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And Bill, we, we could be in danger, you know, of uh, vigorously agreeing with each other. No. Because uh, <laughs> and you won't, we, we won't want that, because uh, you, 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 you promised a, uh, uh, a, a Pax Manesque no. uh, thing. No, you didn't. Or Mrs. Uh, the, Mo <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, um, yeah, the point that, that, that uh, I would make, and I've... I, I, I've been a passionate. I am a passionate believer in nature reserves, as as are you. Uh, I know. Um, my point is that the countryside uh, is is somewhere where we've long associated it with wildlife. The countryside is where the wildlife is, and uh, it's increasingly becoming where the wild things were, and that they're in these nature reserves. And you're quite right that nature reserves are increasingly precious because wildlife is being squeezed out of that, uh, of that wider landscape. So I think that's the point that I've been making. And I know that you and I had a conversation also, Bill, about how um, uh, you, some within the farming community will uh, point the finger of blame at, uh, at many a scapegoat, sparrowhawks, foxes. Oh, God, yes. what's, your, what's your feeling on that? Well, just a quick word, a word on farmers in general. Mm. This goes back a little bit as it happens, but it, and it's, it's extremely relevant because basically if you know and care about wildlife, whoever you are, and particularly if you're a farmer, you do have the opportunity of maintaining the wildlife population as your friend did, you know. Yeah. Uh, but years, some years ago, I went to the annual conference of an organization, you have to remind me what it stood for, FWAG, Farming oh, yes. and Wildlife oh, Advisory Group. Advisory Group. It, it doesn't exist anymore, does it? I'm no, it doesn't. It doesn't. We don't talk anymore, you know, it's like that. But what a, what a good idea. That was 20, 30 years ago. But farming, farmers, wildlife, NGO people and so on and so forth, advisory, talk to each other, suggest things, you know. And, and it was a great group. I'm really sorry that went. But I had a friend there who was, a, rather like your friend, had a wacky great farm in Norfolk and no mm. doubt still has. And that was astonishing. He took me around in a, you know, in a four-wheel drive, and it was like going on a safari ride. You know, yeah. we're driving along with this 
grey partridges leaping out of the way and hares jumping over us, you know. Um, and uh, we didn't, didn't see the lions, unfortunately. But it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was absolutely fantastic. And he had something like half or more percentage of the population of stone curlews, if people know that bird. bird. It's a wonderful bird. And, uh, um, you know, he, he, he obviously would 100% wildlife farmer. Made a lot of money, he's a millionaire, and took photographs as well, and so on and so forth. Um, and I asked him, I said, look, can you give me rough percentages how farmers regard wildlife, and indeed people who are interested in wildlife? And he said, well, he said, there's, I think there's about, you know, I can't remember the exact percentage, but he said something like, I don't know, 40%, 50% who, you know, they, they would do the right thing if you, you know, showed them what to do. If they went to the flag and got advice, they would do the right thing. He said there's another 30, 40% who um, are definitely a little bit interested and they, they will take part. Uh, and he said there's 10% who don't give a fuck, basically. And um, I was silence. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, and, and he said, and they are not only, um, they're not only sort of, they don't care about the wildlife, they can actually be hostile. Mm. And I remember particularly from my childhood, I'm sure Philip does, um, if you happen to go bird watching, as uh, let's say a teenager or something like that, and you go to a local farm or a farm you've never been to before, and um, you can, you know, see birds in the field, you want to go and have a look at them. And the sound that I remember from that period of my life is not the cry of the lapwing or the call of the curlew, it's the distant voice of a farmer going, Oi, get out of here! Yes. Yes. <laughs> I hope that didn't yeah. make anybody. But um, <laughs> um, it, it really was. It was a standard thing. Farmers hated little boys and bird watchers. I don't know which most, but if you're a little boy <laughs> bird watcher, they really hated you. Yeah. And, you know, I remember going to a farm near me in, in Birmingham and saying, Can I have permission to come and have a look at your. They had a lovely little pool there with reeds and, and water birds and so on and so forth. Uh, can I have permission to come? No, you can't! And, in fact, I went back to that a couple of weeks later and he'd filled it in completely. He'd filled it in completely. That's bloody-mindedness and there used to be a lot of it about. I suspect there's still a bit of it about in some, in, in some places. But, you know, that, you know, what, it's, what's that song from Seven Brighters and Oh, the farmers and the friends should be friends. Well, the farmers and the bird watchers should be friends. But um, they're still not quite. They're still not quite. Indeed, indeed. And I think the reach, uh, you know, that whole industrial approach to agriculture and the antipathy towards wildlife, the reach actually goes beyond our shores and onto other countries. Oh, and and uh, you know, I found this, you know, a good icon of that was uh, the jaguar in Brazil. I went out to, uh, to, to Brazil and uh, I was desperate to see a jaguar and so I was, I was guided to go and see them in the Pantanal. And I remember... Uh, I had one night on the Pantanal, and uh, to get there for my one night on the Pantanal and my day looking for jaguars, I had to go along the 100 mile Transpantanera Road. And uh, I have to say that road was, was far too good a word for it. Slipping and sliding, bumping and grinding along this uh, thing which took ages, 124 bridges that were just really rickety planks, many of them, three of them weren't there at all, so we got stuck. Thank goodness for a 4x4, four four, and thank goodness for a randomly passing digger that pulled us out of one of the ravines. But I have to say that when I was there, I was absolutely uh, bowled over by the wildlife. You know, Brazil, of course, is one of the richest or biodiverse uh, countries in the world. And I just remember, you know, we started before dawn, and you know, the, the sun rose like a fireball. And it sprinkled intense spits of orange light across this drenched and shimmering landscape. And, and I remember uh, being absolutely fascinated as you know, there was this explosion of life. And night jars performed their last flutter in the half-light, almost like half-seen shadows. And 
kingfishers were darting for their breakfast, jacanas were dancing on lily pads, limpkins like big brown uh, herons were picking in the shallows, and these uh, family parties of the world's biggest rodent, the capybara, were walking nonchalantly by the car. And nearby lay a caiman, a South, uh, South American alligator with, the, with his leathery avocado skin uh, glistening in the sunlight. And when I got to the end of this extraordinary journey, perilous, nearly losing the car several times in the water or in the, it stuck in the mud, having seen all of this wildlife, I got to a place called Porter Joffrey, and I loved it. I don't know if you've been there, Bill, but I thought it was paradise. And I, I spent my one night there, my one day looking for the jaguar, uh, and I have to say that... Uh, Although I didn't see one, I learned so much more about their plight. And what I learned uh, during that, that time was that jaguars are being driven out of their habitat, rather like the birds here in Britain. Uh, and as the jaguars go, so much goes with it. Being driven out as uh, vast prairies, hundreds of thousands of hectares a year of new soya fields are invading former cattle uh, pastures. The cattle pastures are being ploughed up, the soya is, is, uh, is there in massive crops with uh, your chemical pesticides, artificial fertilisers, so just about everything is obliterated in its path and the cattle are displaced further into the rainforest causing uh, de deforestation. And now that soya, why is it being planted? Is it because of the voracious appetite of vegetarians? <laughs> no. Most of it is being grown to feed factory farmed animals, much of it on other continents, including here in the UK and Europe. And whilst I was there, I, I fell to wondering how many people actually realise that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the reason why so much savanna and rainforest is disappearing is to feed factory farmed animals on other continents, here in Europe, in the UK. Because ultimately that's the bitter truth behind cheap meat, be it chicken or beef or pork, that it's raised on the deforested plains of South America. And on my one night there, almost as a consolation, I, the, the hotelier brought me this, this brochure as I settled down, I opened the brochure, and there in the centrefold was this picture of tourists eagerly uh, photographing the local jaguars. And these tourists are coming from all over Europe, Italy, Germany, UK, coming from the US as well, all over the place. And as I looked at that brochure, at that picture, I couldn't help wondering how many of those eager wildlife tourists had arrived there, stoked up, on cheap meat from soya-fed animals. And it made me think how uh, the industrial agricultural tentacles reach out across the world, you know, rip out all the good in the countryside to make this feed to feed factory farmed animals. Fairly to play devil's advocate a little yes. bit, mm. presumably the food industry, farmers, and the other people involved in it, would claim that they are feeding the world, that yes. what they're doing is actually providing food without which people would suffer. What's your answer to that? Well, that uh, it's the, 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 the industrial agricultural industry is not feeding uh, the world, it's feeding factory farms, which is not the same thing in that those factory farmed animals no, but waste, waste so most of the food value of the soil. So you're saying it's inefficient? It's oh. very inefficient. Uh, and it's much more efficient to have farm animals on pasture, which is a ubiquitous habitat, grows across a quarter of the Earth's land surface, rather than to be using precious 